In the last video, we looked at what would happen if we have two nonpolar molecules that, where the electron cloud temporarily shifts towards one side, creating a temporary dipole, and then inducing a dipole in another nonpolar molecule. But what happens if we do have a permanent dipole? Well, then we get something called permanent dipole-dipole forces. But let's recap on what makes a polar molecule. It has to contain at least one polar bond and it needs to have a net dipole. So let's look at an example, hydrogen chloride. In hydrogen chloride the chlorine is more electronegative than the hydrogen so it's going to have a delta minus charge and hydrogen is going to have a delta positive charge. So in addition to these van der Waals forces, which every single, which exists between all molecules, because the electron cloud in this can still vary, producing a more negative and a more positive charge. So in addition to that, we are going to have these permanent dipole forces. So let's look at what I mean by that. We have our smaller hydrogen and our larger chlorine. Here we have our delta minus and delta positive charges. In these two molecules, we're going to have a force of attraction between this delta positive and this delta minus charge, and this delta minus charge and this delta positive charge. So in addition to these, and we have these van der Waals forces and these. Now this is going to increase the boiling point of this compound, because we have stronger intermolecular forces that we need to overcome. So if we look at, let's say, fluorine, F2, these are non-polar molecules, which means that they're only going to have van der Waals forces. If we look at the boiling point, we have a minus 188 degrees Celsius boiling point for fluorine. But then if we look at hydrogen chloride, which has the same number of electrons, we have a boiling point of minus 85 degrees Celsius. Now this is a much higher temperature than minus 188 degrees Celsius because we have these stronger intermolecular forces that we need to overcome. But if these permanent dipoles result from more electronegative elements attached to less electronegative elements, surely the strength of these intermolecular forces can vary based on the electronegativity of these atoms. And that's true. There is something that exists called hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. Now, hydrogen bonding is the strongest of the intermolecular forces. It's still only about 10% the strength of a covalent bond, but that is an incredibly strong thing considering there is no electron sharing going on. But a hydrogen bond will only form if certain conditions are met. So the first condition is that the molecule must contain a hydrogen atom bonded to either a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine atom. And the second condition is that there needs to be a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen oxygen or fluorine. So let's break this down. Why do these hydrogen bonds only form if hydrogen is attached to nitrogen, oxygen or fluorine? Well, if we look at the top four most electromagnetic elements, we'll see that among them are nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine. So if we have hydrogen bonded to these, these are the cases where the electrons are going to be most towards this element. So we're going to have these delta minus charges are going to be stronger than any other delta minus charges we'll find in permanent dipoles. And what about this lone pair? Well, on, let's say, hydrogen fluoride, we're going to have our electrons most towards this fluorine. So we're going to have delta positive and delta negative, and we're also going to have a lone pair of electrons on 
the fluorine because these aren't involved in any sort of bonding. So then another molecule of hydrogen fluoride is going to have the exact same conditions. Let's just draw this in yellow so it keeps it standard. We're going to have these dipole charges. We're going to have the electrons more towards the fluorine. We're going to have another lone pair. The force of attraction between the delta minus fluorine and the delta positive hydrogen is still going to be there, but we have this lone pair of electrons. Now electrons, as you know, are negative, so this part of the atom is a lot more negative than just a delta minus atom without this lone pair of electrons. So the force of attraction between the lone pair of electrons and the delta positive hydrogen that is more delta positive than any other delta positive charge is going to result in an incredibly strong intermolecular force that we call a hydrogen bond. So it's all well and good knowing the theory behind this, but there is evidence for this hydrogen bonding. And it involves looking at the boiling points, again, of various substances. So on our y-axis, we have our boiling points, and on our x-axis, we have the periods of the periodic table, so the numbers at the top of the periodic table. And on this, we can plot the hydrides of group 4, 5, and 6. Now, the hydrides are where you have the element, and then that's bonded to as many hydrogens as it can. So, an example of carbon, that's CH4. So, if we plot the hydrides of the elements, switch this layer on, we can see that the group 4 hydrides shows a steady increase in its boiling point, because the van der Waals forces increase in strength. But the group 5 hydrides, ammonia, is much higher boiling point than we'd expect to see based off this trend. The rest of the, eight of the elements in group 5 continue to go up, but ammonia is much higher. And we see the same in group 6. Water is a much higher boiling point than we'd see in the rest of the elements of the, peer, of the group 6. And this is because of the existence of hydrogen bonding. So I hope that proof just kind of stabilised that knowledge for you. And that about does it for intermolecular forces.